Good morning, everyone, again, and uh, welcome to the, the, the second um, seminar in our series, The, the Power of Humour. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers briefly, and then Jenna will manage the discussion session. So if you have ideas, comments, or questions that kind of strike you during the presentation, um, please won't you just note them briefly in the chat box, and Jenna will then invite you to discuss them after the presentation. And also, won't you please make sure that you have muted your microphones during the speaker's presentation while they're speaking? That will help us a lot with our, our kind of sound issues. Okay, so practicalities over. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, to you uh, Oloshula Ogunabi and Dare Ido. Um, Dr. Ogunabi is a research fellow at the Center for Gender and African Studies at the University of the Free State here in South Africa. And he's also a visiting researcher at um, Carleton University, Ottawa. And he tells me now that he is actually, it's three o'clock in the morning for him at the moment. So he's just woken up. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking time in the middle of the night to, to present to us. Um, Dara Edo is an assistant lecturer in the political science and international relations program at um, Bowen University um, in Nigeria. And they will be speaking to us today on the idea of soft power in therapeutic comedy. Um, so they tell us that um, beyond being entertaining or therapeutic, humor has this communicative function that they describe as a kind of soft power variable for nation branding. Um, they'll be analyzing the soft power in Nigeria's growing digital comedy, um, looking at comments from admirers from the Mark Angel comedy skits. Um, and the argument is that digital comedy has the soft power to generate a positive affirmation of Nigerianness um, and reposition Nigeria's uh, receding international image. So there are lots of uh, new terms there that I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about. So welcome Olusula and Dare and um, Olusula, over to you. All right. Uh... Thank you very much, Professor Andre, for the introduction. And um, thank you everyone for joining in, in this presentation. We are um, really glad to share some of our work. Um, this um, was actually a publication that took um, a review, took over a year for a review process and um, eventually was published in December 2021, if I remember correctly. And uh, we're just excited to share some of these thoughts with um, with this wonderful audience. Um, in I've done a bit of for me personally. Dari is my mentee. I we try to collaborate. And uh, like I said, my name is Shalal I'm I'm based in right now. I'm based in Edmonton, Alberta, and um, I work with the. University of the Free State and as well as the Alberta Legislature as a parliamentary um, coordinator and also as a research research fellow at Carleton University and um, also with um, originally with the University of the Free State. Um, so generally I've done a bit of, so you please apologize, uh, I apologize in advance if my, my coherence is not very articulate um, because I'm probably pretty much just waking up from a sleep it's 3 a.m. here, and I'm doing my best to make things flow as smoothly as possible. Um, so please um, bear with me. I tried to stay awake as much as possible, but it just wasn't happening. Um, I gave up at 12 p.m., 12 a.m. Um, so this work, basically, for me, I've done pretty much some, my research field is within the realms of international relations and uh, focusing with majorly on soft power, uh, regional uh, hegemonic dynamics, and how soft power can be uh, 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 an equation to be considered in the consideration of regional hegemons or regional power dynamics in Africa and um, how we should begin to appreciate um, countries' influence a lot better by looking at, you know, shifting away our lens from the typical um, hard power competencies or uh, material substance into more subtle uh, means of power. And in this instance, um, what we've tried to do in collaboration with Dari Ido, um, a very intelligent scholar, I must say, is to explore um, the instruments of humor 
as an as a soft power premise and um we do not claim i should put this caveat we do not claim to be authorities in the field of humor we just what we just basically saw was that there's a death of there was a death of um, research in this aspect and um, we thought um, from a multidisciplinary context by combining the the instruments by combining the field of humor in whatever disciplines that may find itself with our soft power we're able to build some intellectual um, arguments around um, its creative use as an instrument of diplomacy and of course we both um, took responsibilities for the paper i hope that Dari is able to join us later on and the body is not able to i'll just um, um take up the um, latter part of the presentation um so uh can i share the slide i don't even know where the slide is i thought it was going to be here can i quickly share the slide perhaps Um, are you able to see my slide, please? Uh, I look it looks like I need uh, to be granted. Um, no, I um, we don't see it yet. I don't. Um, no, we don't see it on our side at all. Okay, let me try again. Let me try again quickly. Um, otherwise, I will just stop that and. Um, There we go. Okay, um, I believe you can see my slide now. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the for, sorry for that delay. Um, so essentially, some of our arguments that we sought to raise in this presentation was to say that because um, I, I like to move into the argument before we begin to move into other. Um, GCI part of the paper. The main argument, because we political science, this is a political science um, located publication on international relations, and the argument we sought to make is that the Nigerian Digital Commits Kids are a potential soft power resource that um, Nigerian government or Nigeria as a whole um, is yet to fully dis discover or exploit as an instrument of um, diplomacy. And we premise this argument, of, in fact, the the whole of the paper was premised on the fact on the argument that um in a way to in a way there seems to be an a lack of understanding of the the remits of of soft power potential that nigeria has that the government is yet to take awareness of or to take full advantage of in a way that um fully utilizes the soft power remits that we have be it um the creative industry be it the nollywood be it sport or whatever you have and so um the main argument that we're trying to make here is that we have a robust, we have in Nigeria, for instance, there's a robust digital commerce kit that is popular around the world that um, the Nigerian state or Nigeria as a whole, or the Ministry of Culture, as it were, can fully take advantage of um, based on the comments or based on the feedback or the responses from quite, um, interviewees that we had in the, in, the, in the paper. And so we argued, for instance, that the Nigerian digital commerce kit um, is able to foster the positive affirmation of Nigerianness, which Nigeria could harness as a subtle and inexpensive means of um, first challenging the demeaning stereotype that um, that is sometimes associated with Nigeria and, and, and Nigerians and what is um, indeed Nigeria, and also um, being able to win the heart and mind of transnational viewers and making them want um, what Nigeria wants, perhaps, and advancing the geo Nigeria's geostrategic and cultural interest of addressing the negative uh, perceptions about Nigeria, and finally extending Nigeria's admiration globally and repositioning Nigeria's receding image. And so that's basically the premise of the argument that we start to make um, throughout, the, throughout the paper by looking at the popularity of um, comedy skits in Nigeria at, across the world and the reception that it has received 
um, by from people across cultures, across religion, across um, nationalities, and the comments that has come through from from these um, um, admirers and followers of Mark Angel comedy skits, and uh, we draw our inferences from from this um, from these responses. So moving on to um, the other part, the more um, theoretical or literature part of the paper, we try to draw on, um, we try to draw on the theoretical context of, you know, just draw generally, like I said, we're not um, humor or humor, the studies on the variety of studies on humor, humor itself on laughter as uh, so a multidisciplinary context. And um, what we try to do is to draw from all of this literature. I don't want to boss with that, but of course we, we looked at humor as a multi-dimensional multi social construct that is observable in most part, most cultural settings along across the world. Um, we, are, we, we state further that uh, despite being a universal phenomenon, humor is problematic in definition and um, incongruent and in, in construct and lacks a definition that is generally acceptable, of course, like every most definitions in the social sciences. Scholars in the field of aesthetics, um, anthropology, philosophy, sociology, um, psychology, and um, as conceptualized humor from the lenses of their respective disciplinary fields, of course, and um, considering this, this con conceptual um, confusion of the meaning of humor, we adopt the term as a, pro as a process that is triggered by verbal and non-verbal stimulus, such as joke, cartoon, comedy, um, tickling, skit video comedy, in which this um, study is located, and other um, and others that evoke pleasurable, um, pleasurable responses in the form of laughter. And uh, this definition is drawn from Chapman and Foots, 1976. Um, yeah, so I move on from there. How we conceptualize humor in this paper as a non-violent resistance to power dictatorship and repress repressive regimes as a coping mechanism of therapy assuaging of assuaging the worrisome challenges of society and also as a means of navigating the challenges of daily life as it relates to especially in Africa. You find some of this literature in the studies from Abada in 2009 and 10. Um, moving forward. Um, the problem statement, of course, is draws from um, the paucity of, of studies on international dimensions of humor. There's a lot of literature in on the psychology, linguistics, sociological, anthropology. But we noticed that in our in our search, literature said we noticed that there's very little studies around humor as it relates to international politics or international um, relations. And um, existing studies largely focus on Russia, which relates to stand-up diplomacy, and um, up until now, uh, and humor in global politics, um, studied by Brassett, Browning, and Wonderborn, 2020, and asked, um, we may want to include our, our latest study then. Um, digital comics kits have not been contextualized as a software resource and tool of diplomacy. And prior to our article, our paper published this year, um, last 2021 actually, literature on the subpar and diplomacy of humor, humorous digital skits in Africa and of African states did not exist. And so this, this was, um, you would excuse any flaw you might see, of course, in, in the publication, you'd excuse um, because this was actually, as far as we know, this is the first contribution that tries to bring um, some nexus between humor and soft power um, studies. There's been tons of studies already in soft power. Basically, um, I think maybe for our, for our audience, I should just try to touch quickly on what soft power, soft power what soft power is. Soft power basically is an instrument of, um, uh, of persuasion, it's an instrument of that states use, um, for instance, to um, to draw attraction or to draw responses from the international community, not necessarily based on cost, question, but based on the attraction to um, or the endearment to, or, yeah, the endearment to resources or anything that exists within the state that um, creates attraction, be it your tourism industry, be it the, the sport, be it the culture, be it um, even the universities. These are all instruments of soft power that are that that can be collated as an instrument of attraction. And so for instance, the reason why some of us are in Canada today studying or working is because of the attraction we have for the intellectual you know, system that, that exists in. Even also the same thing for South, for South Africa. Many of us 
um, there are a lot of international students that have left the country, left their country to come study in South Africa, and um, and that's also because of the subpar attraction that comes from that um, country's higher education industry. I've done a paper in that regard um, before, looking at um, the attraction that South Africa's um, higher education brings globally, and how that also affects or translates into some kind of um, sim sim symbolic leadership globally or within African context, you might say. Um, so I did mention this earlier that the objective of our study is really to um, interrogate the subpar and diplomatic prospects embedded in Nigeria's digital comic skits, comic skits and um, we establish essentially how Nigerian, this digital comic skit can be announced as a tool of diplomacy um, by the Nigerian state. Um, is Daryl here yet? I think I see Daryl. If you're here, please um, unmute yourself so you can continue. Otherwise, yes. I'm happy to. Yes, I'm, I'm here now, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Do you want to put on your video, maybe? Okay. But please, I'll be glad if you can help me retain the slides, sir. I'm using um, another laptop and I don't have- Yeah, sure, sure. I can leave the slide on, definitely. Thank you. Okay. So I will, I will hand over to Dari from here to take it, take it on, then I will come to conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm so sorry I had, um, I experienced internet connectivity challenge. So um, I'll start from the transnational viewers of Mark Angel uh, comedy. Okay, so uh, the Nigerian digital comics kids landscape uh, comprises of many skit makers and famous among them are Makenja Comedy, uh, Mr. Macaroni, Tauma and others. But of all these skit makers that we have in Nigeria, uh, Mark Angel seems to be the one who has received the largest number of uh, transnational viewership and comment posted, you know, comments of affirm affirmative words posted by uh, these transnational viewers. Uh, so from, from our findings, we discovered that uh, the viewers of uh, transnational viewers of Mark Angel skills are uh, nationals of Uganda, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, uh, Kenya, Mozambique, Cameroon, Botswana, Somalia, Liberia, Trinidad and Tobago, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, Malawi, Saltome and Principe, and other countries in Africa. So Mark Angel comedy also enjoys viewership from citizens of Nepal, Philippines, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Turkey, and the United States, Guyana, Australia, the Bahamas, Cambodia, Canada, and Barbados. Uh, so the next slide, sir. Okay, uh, so Makinja comedy skits are acted based on the real life social cultural and economic situation of the Nigerian common man. And it's acted in such a way that it features amusing adult personalities such as uh, Mark Angel, K. Brown, Danielson, and a company of clan-like youngster character, like children, uh, including Emanuela and Success. Now, one major attraction of Mackenzie comedy is the fact that it creates sensible and humor-loaded online skits that trigger uncontrollable laughter among varieties of transnational viewers and, and Nigerians. Uh, so we, 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 we were able to extract from uh, Facebook uh, comments posted by the transnational viewers of Mark Angel Comedy. And I would like to quickly go through some of the distinct comments. Uh, for example, the first one says, that we did not edit the comments, so we extracted the comments directly, so I might have to paraphrase. Anytime I have a bad day, I'll just watch Mark Angel video. Uh, and the reason for this is because it puts a smile on the face of the viewer. Thank you, guys. That's someone from um, New Province. Another from the Philippines says, Emmanuel and Mark, I love you from Philippines. Uh, the, in, in video episode 148, uh, a viewer from Jamaica says, this girl gets a smile on my face every time. Another from Jamaica says, love both girls. They got a gift to have people laughing. I love them both alongside Uncle Mark. Then uh, there's another distinct comment from the Philippines. I love all the episodes. It make my day. I'm a big fan. Emmanuel, Emmanuel and success. God, I, I want to have you little talented and terrible cuties. Who are your parents? They must be very proud of you both. Mark Angel, are you single? I'm Sheila from the Philippines. Can you be my babe? Lord. Uh, the next slide. Sir. Okay. Uh, another viewer from the United States says, I love watching them. They are the most precious, beautiful thing ever. Uh, the same person, I love Emanuela and success. These beautiful little girls are so hilarious. 
I cannot get enough of them. God bless you. Uh, another from India, a transnational viewer from India says, it's like a laughter therapy in the morning. Thanks for your talented comedy videos. Um, they are so funny. Whenever I feel bored, I just watch them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I pray you live long and keep putting smiles on my face. That's a transnational viewer from Kenya. Uh, another from Bhutan City says, I really, really love you both. Uh, you, you, both my, you both are my medicine when I'm tired uh, because of your funny video, videos. I relax. I feel relaxed watching you all. Uh, there's another uh, transnational viewer who says, um, uh, okay, I'll quickly move to uh, a transnational viewer from Brooklyn, the United States, who says, uh, I was in a sad mood. One, mood. Once I went online, I saw my angel post. I will not feel hungry for the whole day. Well, like I said earlier, we didn't edit the comments, so we copied them directly as posted by the transnational viewers. And what this person was trying to say is, uh, whenever he or she is feeling bad and in a sad mood, he or she would always view Mackenzie comedy skits. Okay, uh, there's another transnational viewer from uh, the Philippines who says, watching from Philippines, I can't help not to laugh so hard. Even the neighbors of mine got irritated. Uh, another from the United States is, I'm from Georgia, USA. I can't, but, I can't help but laugh my head off. Keep it up, Mark. And there's another from Istanbul who says, I love Nigerian accents. I understand nothing. And this guy is funny. And then the last person from South Sudan says, I'm Mr. Gabi from South Sudan, Juba. I like to watch Mark Angel comedy, special four of them, because they are so funny. Mark, Angel, Emanuela, Success, Kebran, Walai. They are so funny, more than Aki and Popo. Uh, this video is so funny and lost my stress every day. All right, so uh, I haven't gone through, I haven't discovered this, the expression of uh, affirmative words for Nigeria uh, by watching Mackenzie Comedy Speak. So we adopted a methodology of uh, in interviewing these transnational viewers. So we adopted online semi structural interview of the transnational viewers of Mackenzie Comedy who have expressed uh, positive comments and words of affirmation. And we also extracted comments from the videos posted by Mark Angel. So we contacted 145 transnational viewers through Facebook, through the comments they posted on Facebook. And of the 145, 36, 36 agreed to participate in the study. So the, 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 the responses we received from them were from the transnational viewers who are analyzed using content analysis. And, uh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Ogunubi has talked about. I think I've power. touched on, yeah, I've touched on this earlier. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, now our findings. Why do transnational viewers watch Mark Angel speech regularly? Okay, so from our findings, uh, both from our interview, the analysis of our interview, and then the comments we extracted from the transnational viewers, we discovered that transnational viewers of Mark Angel speech watch Mark Angel, regular, Mark Angel speech regularly because of their therapeutic potentials in evoking uncontrollable laughter that lightens the mood of transnational viewers and put a smile on their face. Uh, others have also, some of them have also adopted Mark Angel comedy skits as stress management and pain relief therapy. Uh, that's basically because they find the skits exciting, amusing, interesting, and culturally acceptable. And more importantly, uh, some of the transnational viewers identify that the skits help them to overcome boredom uh, boredom, depression, and especially the depressive thoughts, uh, boredom, stress, and pain characteristics of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown. Okay, so um, uh, drawing largely from the work of Nye 2008, who argued that the nationals of a state must accept uh, and consider the soft power of another state as legitimate, we argue that because transnational viewers accept uh, Mark Angel's kids, and then because the transnational acceptance of Mark Angel's kids transcends the shores of Africa, number one. And secondly, because transnational viewers uh, give, uh, they articulate words of uh, admiration and affirmation for Nigeria and acceptance of Nigeria. And also because the transnational viewers are inquisitive to know more about Nigeria because of Mark Angel's kids. We conclude, drawing from the work of year 2008, that Mackenzie's uh, digital comic speed constitutes a major and pivotal soft power resource that Nigeria can use as a tool of diplomacy. Uh, the next slide. Okay, so um, apart from this, we identify three major ways by which Nigeria can adopt Mackenzie's digital comic speed as a tool of diplomacy. 
We identified cultural diplomacy. Nigeria can adopt it as a tool of cultural diplomacy, as a tool of celebrity diplomacy, and as a tool of digital diplomacy. Now, the cultural diplomacy is basically the use of the cultural export of a state uh, towards the attainment or the achievement a country of, a, of a country's foreign policy objective. That is, using the cultural export, the acceptable cultural export of a country towards uh, achieving the foreign policy objective of a state. And now, Nigeria has always been depicted in negative mode in the globe, uh, basically because some Nigerians you know, commit crimes abroad. And this has often been taken, especially in the Western media, you know, as representative of the whole of Nigeria, which is false. Which is false. You know, the fact that a few Nigerians commit crimes abroad should not be used as you know, a template for labeling Nigerians as criminals and Nigeria as a country with citizens who have a tendency to commit crime. Now, drawing from this comment from a transnational viewer from South Africa, who says, most Nigeria I see in our country are selling drugs and prostitutes. I'm not saying all of them, but by watching my angel comedy, we realize that there is a good side as well in Nigeria. That's a transnational viewer from South Africa. So we then argue that if trans transnational viewers can have a good perspective about Nigeria, contrary to what obtained in uh, you know, the projection of Nigeria and Nigerians in the Western media, then trans, uh, digital comic skits by Mark Angel and others uh, can be exploited as a major tool of challenging the stereotypes and negative perspect uh, perspectives and perceptions that you know, transnational viewers have about Nigeria. And secondly, because uh, Mark Angel skits are based on the rich material, uh, the morals and cultural components of the Nigerian people, we argue that Mark Angel skits helps to uh, export and project and advance the good image you know, of the Nigerian culture to the world. So it's a medium of exporting the Nigerian culture to the world, which people actually find acceptable. Um, you know, exporting the rich morals and values of the Nigerian culture, most of which are rooted in you know, the cultural values of a good man. You know, the concept of a good man in the Yoruba society called Omoluabi uh, and uh, of the Igbo society, Ezebo Madu. And we also find similarity in the South African society, the Ubuntu philosophy, and also, okay, yeah. So we we'll move to the second aspect, which is celebrity diplomacy. Well, uh, countries of the world have often used their celebrity diplomats, uh, celebrities as, you know, as diplomats in one way or the other. Even the United Nations uh, at the time had to use uh, George Clooney and Angelina Jolie as celebrity diplomats and as peace ambassadors. But then the soft power of a state is often resident in its non-state resources, such as iconic personalities. So we drew largely from this to establish that if the United Nations can make use of you know, celebrities as tool of diplomacy, uh, Nigeria can actually appropriate the celebrity diplomacy potentials of Mark Angel's kids uh, as tool of you know, achieving its geostrategic national interest. And this is because Mark Angel's kids are watched by you know, admirers all over the world. So Mark Angel comedy actors have become transnational celebrities with admirers from many countries of the world, one. Number two, they have large followership on social medias who are basically transnational viewers and admirers, number two. And then the third one, because transnational viewers of Mark Angel's kids are always eager to visit Nigeria, basically because they want to see Mark Angel and Emanuela and success. So we argue that uh, they constitute a major celebrity diplomacy tool that Nigeria can use you know, in achieving its foreign policy objectives. So uh, here we argue that Mark Angel actors and actresses are persuasive non-state celebrity diplomats and incontestable soft power agents that Nigeria can use in advancing its geostrategic cultural interests of addressing the negative stereotypes and perceptions about Nigeria and the Nigerian state. So now concluding on uh, celebrity diplomacy, we argue that Abuja can exploit, that is the seat of the Nigerian government, can exploit the transnational acceptance of Mark Angel, Emanuela, success, and other uh, uh, actors of the Mark Angel skits as tool of extending Nigeria's admiration globally and making other states want what Nigeria wants, according to Idowu and Ogunobi, 2022. Uh, so now moving um, to, 
Okay, I'll, I'll oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so moving to digital di diplomacy. Uh, digital diplomacy is basically the exploitation of the proceeds of digital information and communication technology and the internet in the pursuit of diplomatic objectives of the state, according to addition of 2017. Now, here we argue that because transnational viewers accept uh, Nigerian digital commit schemes, and because you know, it serves as a medium for the Nigerian youth to register their voice and insert their creative presence with valuable content on the World Wide Web as against the way Nigerians are depicted on the World Wide Web. Uh, and that's number one. And secondly, because, uh, okay, so on this basis, sorry, we argue that Nigeria can exploit the skits produced by Nigerians as subtle and inexpensive non-state rhetoric you know, in winning the hearts and minds of foreign publics and advancing Nigeria's geostrategic cultural interests. The point here is that uh, if Nigerian youths are able to, you know, upload content on the World Wide Web that nationals of other countries find admirable and acceptable, then Nigeria can appropriate it as a tool of digital diplomacy, especially in challenging the demeaning, you know, description stereotypes about Nigeria. One. And then number two, in extending the global admiration of Nigeria. And by this, we mean that, you know, a way of endearing Nigeria more to transnational viewers. And thirdly, Nigeria can use it as a tool of winning the hearts and minds of foreign publics uh, with a view to achieving Nigeria's geostrategic interests in the global system. Okay, I will uh, say thank you. Thanks, Darren. Thanks. I will take the concluding part. I think um, it's safe to say that um, for the most part of our study, uh, the, the, the fundamental premise is that there was a there's a there's an interesting dynamics about Nigeria in the way that you know, on the one hand it presents um, it presents many negative aspects to you know what we know as Nigeria or Nigerians, and on the other hand it also presents an interesting dynamics of a lot of beautiful components that includes the um, admiration of the Mark Angel comedy skits as lo along many other comedy skits that you will find um, on, on, on social media. And uh, we draw inferences from this assumption or this, this um, assumption that um, for Nigeria to fully you know, change the narrative around how it is perceived globally because that we there's a fundamental issue about perception. Perception is quite important internationally. And for a country to um, change perception in a way that recenters re the, 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 the narratives around positive aspects of, of soft power, they can begin to address some of these stereotypes that many have, and in a way also begin to attract um, the kind of att um, attention that it deserves as a powerful country in, in Africa. And so the conclusion is to establish the fact that Mark Angel comedy skits, as as much as um, it's loved across the world, needs to be converted into um, some um, kind of soft power possibilities in um, several aspects of diplomacy that the Nigerian state or Nigeria can positively affirm its Nigerianness as subtle ways of repositioning itself to address the receding its receding image in international sphere. You would agree for those of us who might have followed um, Nigerian foreign policy over the over the last three, four decades, you notice that there's a there's a downward trend, you know, from the 70s and the 60s and compared to what you have now. And part of that and part of ways to address this downward downward trend is to reposition the country in a way that takes advantage of elements that um, bring admiration, elements that and it's been well established in literature that um, um, what makes some countries big or what makes some countries strong or what, what makes some countries admirable or, 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 or better regarded than others is not necessarily because of their material preponderance, not necessarily because of their superior uh, manpower or superior um, war, power, war, war, war assets, but fundamentally because of their assets in um, their subtle assets or their um, creative assets that they've been able to take adv full advantage of and, um, and this is where we are uh, positioning our paper to say that um, there's a lot that Nigeria, the Nigerian state itself or the ministries, uh, respective ministries need to take advantage of to um, take to reposition its, its, its youth 
or it's it's um it's creative industry as a super reservoir for influence globally and also in in Africa. Um, thank you for listening. Thanks. Um, thanks so much. Uh, sorry, I should um, jump in there and just um, um, thank you for a very, I can see from the chats um, questions that there are all sorts of very interesting and exciting elements that people want to start chatting to you about. So I'm going to hand over to Jenna to, to kind of um, manage the, the, um, the discussion. Um, thanks so much. Thanks so much for being able to 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 actually um, present at three in the morning, and <laughs> also that um, Dare managed to actually get on. Very um, happy about that. Um, could you maybe also stop? Do your stop sharing, and then okay. um, um, we'll hand over to Jenna to kind of um, manage the discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, over to you, Jenna. I'm going to. Thanks so much, Andrea, and um, thank you. Yes, for a very interesting presentation indeed. Um, I can honestly say that I wouldn't be coherent at 3 a.m. in the morning. I, I wouldn't be able to speak. I don't even think I'd be able to read. So um, well done on, on being able to do that. Um, we've got three questions from Dr. Massey Sekavat. So I'm going to hand over to you, Massey, and you can get started with your questions. Hi, everyone. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation and uh, Jenna and Professor Hirsch, thank you very much for organizing these sessions. Can you hear me okay? Definitely. Yes, yeah. very clear. Okay, good, great. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, well, I put my questions in the chat box. So the first question was about the reception of male and female comics in the context of Nigeria. Is there any difference? Between, uh, between the reception of humor produced by male and female comics in that context. If I'm to, I, I don't know if Dari has anything to say about um, that, but, but I think that we did not particularly pay attention because this, uh, this comments were extracted from responses and sometimes in order, the other half of it was extracted from um, questions posed to respondents. So I would not particularly pay attention to color or to gender in this instance, um, because we do not think it's to be a, an important variable. But it would be interesting to, of course, see perhaps you're insinuating that um, um, uh, females or women are more endeared to comedy skits than their male counterparts, or that, um, I, I, I don't know, but it would be interesting to see how that variable um, might have changed or affected some of the comments or responses that we we gathered so maybe now that you have called my name i will follow up with one more question and then because um my third question overlapped with other questions i won't uh i won't continue so uh, another question would be what about the role of economy uh um, is there any, do you conceive any place for fiscal interest in the relationship between power and humor in the context of Nigeria? Uh, let me pass that question to Dari. I have my thoughts actually, but I'll pass the question to Dari to see if he has anything to share. Okay. Um, if, if I get the question, I think he's asking if there is a correlation between, um, if there is, a correlation between humor and you know fiscal you mean economy in of course yes in in, in nigeria uh, nigerians are now clamoring for or um experts in the nigerian creative industry are now clamoring for the need for the nigerian government to invest more you know in the creative sector of the nigerian states and more particularly the skits uh skits making industry because uh, the skit making industry in Nigeria is very dynamic, and in its dynamism, it has transcended beyond even what we have written in our paper on soft power. Skits are now even used for advertisement. Companies employ skit makers, you know, to advertise their products for them, and these skit makers are paid, and some even get endorsement. So there is a strong correlation between humor and economy in the context of skit making in Nigeria. And it's one of the areas that we are hoping to explore further, you know, in our research. 
Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, David. I think I also recall um, an instance of two. I think recently in Nigeria, two security guards in a in a popular restaurant dancing, and for they're, they're dancing, you know, to a, to a popular song, and for that reason, they were sacked. And if you read comments on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, and all of that, a lot of people were saying that you know this company should have translated or turned this attention around for positive gain. And, and so it, it makes you see, for instance, how um, skits could, could be a source of driving an economy or skits could be a source of advertisement, like Darius said, or be a source of um, transforming an economy or use it for advertisement or for, for driving a, a particular promotional brand. So of course, I, I do agree in, in many ways that um, there's a correlation and um, it's something probably one should explore further in future research. Thanks very much for your question, Massey. Uh, Dr. Falani, do you have a question in relation to Dr. Sekovac's question? Or is it a new question altogether? Um, I have a reaction to one of his questions, and um, although I still have my questions to them, but I, I don't know if you allow me to take everything now. Um, no, can I take you after everyone? Because I'm, okay, I'm going fine, to go with fine, everyone fine, in order. Fine. But if you have a reaction to something that... Um, yes, I, I have a comment on the question on gender and human performance in Nigeria. Um, what is up to never is that we have fewer female comedians, all right? Sure. And um, that might just be the only explanation we have for that. And that is not peculiar to Nigeria anyway. But um, there is no difference in the kind of reception that female comedians have and male comedians have. As much as female comedians have their own um, individual comedic concerts, all right, male comedians do have theirs too. So there is no difference in that sense, you know, but just that the numbers of performers we have based on gender differs. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Falani, for adding insight to that for us. Um, I'm going to get back to you in order. Um, so it's Jason van Nikert next. Um, I see that you've got three questions, Jason. Thanks. I, they're basically, I, I just entered them quickly, but it boils down to two related things. The one is, um, I can see the appeal of this as a South African, where the paradigm even for this uh, seminar series is Trevor Noah. There's a lot of uh, cultural ambassadorial work that we can recognize. But at the same time, um, that paradigm example of uh, lifting up the national image wasn't sponsored by the state or endorsed by the state in any formal way. So I'm interested in what kind of relationship this soft power has, because the suggestion here is that there's something about this individual performer who's created an individual platform that can be leveraged by the state. So the question is, is this an endorsement? Is this a suggestion that the, the, the state should be um, paying to increase his footprint in new markets or setting up workshops for similar sorts of individuals? And the, the questions there are, how close a relationship does one performer want to have with the state in case they have political views that might differ from it? Uh, which could be compromised by that relationship. Um, and and uh, I, I think I'd, I'd stop there, but what, in what sense is there an action that's being taken as opposed to uh, passively rising on the tide generated by the goodwill that comes from this individual to action? Um, I'd like to respond to the question. Uh, our major argument in this work is the need to awaken the Nigerian government uh, towards exploiting its numerous soft power resources uh, as tool of diplomacy. In our previous work published in, we, have, we, are, we are privileged to be the first set of uh, scholars to publish on the South African, the viral South Africa's Jerusalem song uh, published in the Roundtable Journal, Music and Dance Diplomacy in the uh, COVID-19 era. We published the article that was last year, August, the Roundtable Journal, and our major argument in that article is the fact that the South African government was very apt and smart in the exploitation of the global admiration of the Jerusalem dance, song and the hashtag Jerusalem dance, uh, dance challenge as tool of diplomacy. 
the South African government was very, very happy. In fact, even to the point of uh, employing uh, Master KG and uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name of the female singer Zimkodi. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, uh, as cultural ambassadors, you know, you know, pro of projecting South Africa's geostrategic interests, well, in the aspect of culture majorly. Now, comparing South Africa with Nigeria, the Nigerian government over time has been docile, you know, in the use of its more, many soft power uh, resources. And our argument in this paper is more of like a recommendation to the Nigerian government to be more active and to be more proactive towards exploiting uh, these soft power resources as tool of diplomacy. At the moment, the Nigerian government has not you know, expressed any, any form of, you know, any, any kind of state response you know, towards these kids. But then these kids have val potentials you know, for achieving many cultural interests of the Nigerian state especially in redeeming the dented image of Nigeria in the global system. And then, so our argument is the need for the Nigerian government to be active towards exploiting. And how can Nigeria exploit this skills? All that the Nigerian government could do is to one, maybe perhaps fund the skit making industry. And of course, uh, give them contents, contents that they can project, you know, content that can, they can use to project the good image of Nigeria, and then counter the narratives, the stereotypes that are existing at the moment. So that's the major, it's more of like a recommendation to the Nigerian government. Now, the paper, uh, if, if you can assess the paper, you know, these are some of our recommendations that the Nigerian government should be act towards exploiting uh, this, uh, this soft power tool. And it, it, we, uh, our argument also resonates with at uh, the work of Tela, I think that's 2000 and um, that should be 2020, where he argued that, uh, well, in quotes, Nigeria is punching below the weight of its soft power resources. That is, Nigeria has enormous soft power resources, yet the Nigerian state is underutilizing these soft power resources. I remember there was a time when uh, a minister, now late, uh, Nigerian Minister of Information and Communication, was trying to rebrand Nigeria. And then she went about you know, visiting many countries of the world as a way of rebranding Nigeria. But that's very expensive because, of course, you spend on flying abroad and so on. But the same goal she will achieve, and that's the late Professor Dora Quinn, the same goal she would achieve by traveling to other countries of the world as a means of redeeming Nigeria's image is the same thing Mark Angels are doing without having to pay. So it's an, on, it's an inexpensive medium for the Nigerian state to achieve its cultural interests in the global system. I don't know if Dr. Ogunobi is willing to contribute to this sir yeah you you've said quite a lot and already and uh, which i also endorse and it's just safe to add that um, there's a thin line between propaganda and what the states and i think that's where um, the prof's comment was trying to drive out that um when that, when the country begins to take over or to have more hands in some of these um, um freelance digital skits it, it begins to look like propaganda and that can come across as trying to um, change a narrative in your own in your own direction of you know to paint a picture that is, does not exist. Uh, though, so I agree that there's a thin line between propaganda and diplomacy, and um, that's where uh, um, in the, to the extent that the country is democratic and is able to use the full arsenal that it has um, to. And for instance, with the U.S., everything we watch about the U.S. is informed by how the states subtly you know um, you know commands and controls. What happens with the economy and what happens whether or not we like it so it's it's pretty much what what we expect to happen in this instance it doesn't happen what people see what people watch what people hear informs their narrative informs their perception about the country and how we have you know our perception sometimes when i'm here people ask me about um xenophobia in south africa and that's because sometimes that is what they hear that's what they watch that's what they see and so if people see often the good sides of the country and this pop um um, propagated through some of these digital commerce kits um, that promote some of the cultural elements that he talked about in the lower B that Tela 2020 had also researched extensively. We can begin to then, you know, uh, di uh, diverse or diverse, yeah, um, the 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 power elements that we have, the creative power elements that we have as a country. Um, thank you both for those answers. I, I like them. I just want to part with uh, something that I think uh, might be a helpful uh, comparison. Uh, what Dara was saying about uh, 
how this could be used for further funding this, this get industry sort of thing. A model that might be useful for this is that in the United Kingdom for a significant amount of time, uh, there were um, government sub arts subsidies which were allocated to stand up comedians. And even though the content of the, the stand-up skits politically varied quite strongly, um, they were giving grants to people saying quite different things. Uh, it was seen as a way of supporting uh, local artists, which ended up having knock-on benefits as an international uh, cultural um, product that was exported. So uh, Stuart Lee, in, in some of his work, uh, some of his writing about stand-up comedy, has said things about the, the value of um, cultural grants that came from the United Kingdom that sustained that system. And it might be worth that thinking about that as a, as a comparison. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, sorry if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. Audra Laid. Mm -hmm. That's what Jella did, Mary. I'm not sure she knows um, it's, it's her name. <laughs> okay, let me just go up and read her question then, and um, maybe you can just answer for us then. How does gender switch play out in humor comedy generally? Does it have any advantage to be harnessed in relation to political diplomacy? Yeah, interesting question, really. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question, but it's um, it's beyond the realm of our of our work. And um, um, of course, I know a lot of comedy attractions comes from um, skit makers dressed as you know dressed in the opposite sex or as as in work and using that. Maybe that also brings traction. Um, but uh, it it will be interesting to see how that translates into political diplomacy. Um, in terms of um, cross dressing as um, digital skit making, and well, that's but I, I believe that's what she refers to as the gender switch play play out, uh, which is in this instance it's um, cross dressers uh, playing the role of um, comedy skits. Uh, so uh, for me, I'm, I'm I'm keen to explore that and see how it it connects together in in terms of political diplomacy or how gender informs political diplomacy or gender rules and skit making and forms political diplomacy. I'm not sure what Dari has to say about that. No, I don't have anything to say. I think that can be your next, um, the next paper you, both of you can co-write. Yeah, yeah, of course. I was oh, gonna say that actually, it's, 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 it's interesting to explore that, that, that angle. If, if there's a connection, why not? If there are literatures around that, why not? Um, yeah, it's, I'll, I'll love to explore that and see what, what connection exists between political diplomacy and skit making, definitely. Thank you for that question, Mary. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna move over to Dr. Falani, who's been waiting patiently. Yeah, thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. I enjoyed listening to you. And um, you have given me some new insights to explore in comedy analysis. Um, I very much agree with many of the things you have said, because I'm trying to think not of comedy now, but of Nollywood and the way um, Nigerian government has been trying to tap into Nollywood as a form of cultural capital for us and as a form of economic um, influence in the global sphere. Um, you will agree with me that um, Nollywood now is um, not the Nigerian thing anymore so to say. And then um, it's all in almost all world film festivals now you will find um, some kind of tans or some kind of um, um, spot for Nollywood too. However, I'm skeptical of your, of your conclusion. And um, I'm skeptical because I think that I ask linguistic questions and I do linguistic analysis. And when I look at the content of these kids as a text, as a cultural okay. text, and I'm trying to tease out the kind of meanings the comedians are presenting to the audience, I do not see anything positive in them. Now, um, 
we, we, we make a distinction between punching up, punching down. And um, when we think about all of these terminologies and we look at what many of Nigerians kick makers do, we will realize that they are using humor in a negative sense. And the, high, the, the, the funny thing with humor and jokes is that jokes that strive on stereotype, jokes that um, portray something in negative form are the kind of jokes that sell more. So um, when we think of some of Mackenzie's comedy, it's um, or maybe uh, Mr. Macaroni comedy, we begin to yeah. think out some kind of negative cultural stereotype that have been perpetuated either in terms of gender stereotyping, either in terms of um, um, negative stereotyping of Nigerians. And um, I, I recall one of Basket Mouth's kids in, I think in Sweden or Finland, I can't recall now. And he made a very terrible joke about Nigerians in a foreign country. And I'm wondering, when I put all of these things together and I'm thinking about um, how we can now bring them together and say that, like I said, I agree with many of what you have said, but the conclusion, I, I think that there is need for some kind of re-engineering, rethinking of what sure, we have sure. in all of these contexts. I am not talking about instances where jokes have created some kind of some kind of arguments, um, for instance, um, the basket mouth direct joke or the travel noise back joke on race, you know, but I'm not talking about all of that, but there have been so many instances where um, people just laugh at those jokes. And then when I think deeper and I look at them, I'm like, these jokes are negative. They do not give us anything positive about our country, about our culture. And in most instances, the Omolua B you have mentioned are not realizing them. However, I think because um, those jokes have this um, capacity to be viral and they draw attention and then by that um, people tend to follow them and then they, because the producer becomes so popular, it becomes some kind of person wielding some cultural power, which also reflects him or has some kind of economic power. So in a way, to a great extent, I, I don't know how we will reconcile like I said, I, I, there, there is so much truth in what we have said when we consider some kind of cultural productions like Mollywood and if we think of the Western world, um, museum, concerts, um, um, music festivals taking place in summer or winter that attract people across the world. You know, these um, comedy kids have the capacity of generating such effects. But at the same time, the, the content of those met, um, skits are not so positive for us. And then um, sometimes they, they, they make the paint Nigeria in a very terrible picture. You know, and that is my point. So that is the point I'm trying try driving at. So thank you very much. I would like to respond to uh, what the doctor has raised. Can I go ahead? Okay. Uh, oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to be honest, Doctor, um, many of the skits produced by uh, Nigerian skit makers have this uh, tendency to stereotype, uh, majorly women. Uh, it's more of like um, um, sexual objectification of women, especially women who have, you know, um, very uh, appealing uh, sexual features. But then not all of them projects this negative stereotyping. Um, or should I say, some project a few, not as many as we think you know, they are. And that was why we were careful enough to adopt Mac Angel comedy as against Mr. Macaroni, Ao, and others. Now, let me take Mr. Macaroni, for example. Mr. Macaroni basically objectified, you know, in his skits, they are, they are, they are, they are, like, most of his skits, he, he often make use of women with, you know, big heaves and, you know, sexual objectification of women and things like that. So that's a common trend in his skit, uh, which many Nigerians have even complained about. And then for Taho, our whole style is, you know, uh, giving out uh, retribution in terms of facial slap you know, to our daughter, you know, in most of our skits. But then we were careful not to select the two skits uh, 
because one, the large few, they have few transnational viewership. We observe that transnational viewers uh, view them less than the view Mackenzie comedy. That's one. The number two, I, I viewed over a hundred of Mackenzie comedy skits. You know, in the process of writing uh, this this article, and you know, most of the things Mackenzie projects are uh, things majorly positive things that are traceable to the Nigerian culture. Things like honesty, uh, kindness. Uh, uh, you know the, the 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 characteristics of a good man in majorly the Hebrew society and the Yoruba society, and so that's our major reason for selecting Mac Angel comedy for this uh, paper. But then we agree with your point that some, well, most of the skits produced by Nigerian, you know, in fact, it has become a norm now. Many of them are basically you know sexual related skits and all that. Like, like. But then for Mac Angel, I think Mac Angel is distinct in that regard. Now, I'm not exonerating McIngel's skit, but then I, I, I perused over a hundred of his skits. And before making yeah. our conclusion, we discovered that most of his skits are based on these values that even in one of our, um, uh, an Indian national uh, posted, you know, one of the comments an Indian national posted, you know, he was like, he finds most of the good moral values in uh, McIngel comedy similar to an Indian oh, culture. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the, the name of that uh, Indian philosophy, but what it means is like the world is like a family. So you treat strangers like your family member. So the Indian national uh, project to the world and the cultures of the transnational viewer, specifically uh, that of the Indian national that I talked about. So in conclusion, I agree with your point, sir, that many of the skits produced by Nigerian skit makers now uh, have this issue of sexual objectification, negative stereotypes, but then Mark Angel, I think we can mark, exonerate Mark Angel. And that was why we adopted Mark Angel for this work. Thank, thank you. you very much, Dorit. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I know we've run five minutes over, so I'm just going to hand back over to Andrea um, to finish off um, our second seminar. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you, everybody. That was very, I mean, especially in the discussion and the question time, um, there is so much um, more to think about and to research. Um, I quite agree with the, the um, you know, the final chat that there are so many questions and um, so much future research on this, uh, this theme. So it's very exciting. Um, thank you both very, very much for, for um, presenting to us and starting off um, what seems to be or is pr promising to be a very, very exciting um, seminar series. Um, just a quick announcement. So next week's presentation will be on humor in the time of the coronavirus. Um, this will be a content analysis of um, Egyptian comedic expressions on Facebook. Um, and this will be by Dr. Lofty and Dr. Solomon of the British University in Egypt. So we're very much looking forward to um, next week's presentation. And thank you all very much for being here and for uh, creating such a stimulating forum for discussion. Um, I will unfortunately have to say goodbye, but um, yes, thank you all and see you all next week. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Good morning. Yes, sleep well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I will. I'll try. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Take care. Talk to you lots later. Of coffee. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Great. Bye. All right, I will end the session now. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.